<laughs> All right, Linda, are we rolling? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, today being uh, Wednesday, May 11th, it is 9 a.m. I'm calling the regular Board of Investment meeting to order. Uh, with, before we proceed, um, Madam Secretary, will please provide us with the adequate announcements and roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Santos. This meeting is being conducted as a virtual meeting, so I will do a roll call of the trustees to confirm attendance. Mr. Knox? Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Mr. Green? Hi, Chair. Good morning. Thank you. Mr. Kehoe? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mr. Ms. Green was not here. Mr. Jones? Uh, present. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Here. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez? Okay, and Chair Santos? Present. Thank you. Um, staff particip participating in the meeting include the following, CEO Santos Craman, CIO John Grable, Chief Counsel Stephen Rice, Barry Liu, Legislative Affairs Officer, and Ted Granger, Interim CFO. We also have the investment staff, Christopher Wagner, Jim Rice, Vach MS Region, Jude Perez, Scott Drazel, Esmeralda Del Bos, Noah Damsky, Daniel Joy, Cheryl Liu, and Derek Kong. Consultants include the Makita Investment Group, Alborn Group, and the Stepstone Group. Trustees, please use the Zoom chat option to be placed in the queue. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute their mics until you're ready to speak. And now we may proceed with the agenda. Great, thank you, uh, Linda, for that. Uh, it appears to me that we do have a quorum, so we move forward. Uh, subsection two, approval of the minutes for April 13th. I uh, Linda? Yes, so uh, Mr. Kelly had requested two staff action items for last month, which were for the CEO to conclude, which were two memos titled, the first one is titled Board Trustees Return to the Boardroom Discussion as Requested by Trustee Kelly. The second item was a board action and opinion on legislation found to be contrary to, leg to Lacerra's interests and values, and this was also requested by Trustee Kelly. Okay, so with that change, so do I understand this correctly? Um, we are attaching, or the staff is attaching those memos to uh, the minutes? We will add those two items that Mr. Kelly requested for staff action items for the um, April 13th meeting, and we'll do a revised meeting minutes. Would that, would that satisfy you, Mr. Mr. Kelly? Oh, yes, absolutely, sir. All right, great. So I will entertain a motion to approve the, the minutes for April 13th. 2022. Keith, David, so moved. I'll second to David. It's been moved and second. I don't see any other requests to uh, comment on the minutes. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Knox? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Ms. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mrs. Jones? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Uh, Ms. Sanchez? I don't see her. And Chair Santos? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you very much. Next item is a uh, report on closed session items. Uh, good morning. Any report out will be posted to lacera.com after the meeting. Great, thank you for that. I understand that we don't have the public comment or request for public comment. Is that true? Correct. Is that great. Yeah. So we're moving forward. Uh, Section five, uh, CEO report. Yes, Chair, Chair Santos, good morning. Uh, very brief uh, update for you. In addition to the information contained in the CEO report, there's a couple of items I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. So I did want to, uh, to inform you all that staff uh, did return to the office beginning last week on Monday. Um, We've uh, had uh, really good discussions with staff. It appears that um, they are all uh, uh, very happy to be back uh, into the office. We are implementing a hybrid work model where um, staff will come in on alternating weeks and uh, they will be uh, working um, remotely on, uh, on their week uh, to work from uh, their uh, home uh, addresses. Um, so, the staff, a uh, uh, number of staff 
people that have come into the office has uh, nearly doubled. So we were about 15% of the staff um, in the office on a daily basis. We're up to about 30, between 30 and 35% given, um, depending on the day. Um, and so we're uh, anticipating that that number will grow uh, slightly, but since we're on a, a hybrid work model, it will probably remain right around 40% is what our target is. Um, so I did want to uh, let you know that things are going well um, in the office and people seem to be uh, uh, satisfied with the hybrid work model that we're implementing as a standard operating procedure moving forward. Uh, in terms of uh, the MOU to implement the calls that were approved by the Sarah boards, um, we've had ongoing discussions with county council uh, in trying to make some technical changes in verifying calculations and uh, making sure that the ordinances are uh, written properly, have the right information in it, and the salary schedules are accurate. And so we plan on returning all of the information to the county uh, today. Um, so the ball will be in their court in terms of uh, their final review and agendizing it on the Board of Supervisors agenda. And so we'll keep you posted on that progress um, as we move forward. Uh, the last um, item is in terms of the hiring of investment staff. We've been working very closely with Mr. Grable and his staff. Uh, we, we did um, successfully post uh, positions for the FA3 positions, senior investment officer positions, we made the, um, so, uh, Mr. Grable made the selection on the PIO uh, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. And so we're moving forward on our recruitment efforts. Uh, we should start receiving applications and resumes uh, within the next week or so. Um, and we've um, also uh, received the uh, proposals for executive recruitment using uh, an executive uh, recruitment firm. And so we're in the process of reviewing all of those now and making selections to uh, to go out for the uh, higher level positions, uh, chief financial officer, chief technology officer, deputy CIO, and so on and so forth. So we're moving along pretty well uh, in terms of the hiring for Mr. Grable. We like to move a little faster, but um, as soon as uh, Mr. Grable begins to uh, receive the resumes and the applications, he'll start um, um, making some decisions about uh, interviews and scheduling and so on and so forth. So that is my report. Um, be more than happy to stand for questions. Great, thank you for that. I don't see any requests to speak. So I'm moving the agenda forward. Um, we are going into uh, the CIO report. Good morning, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Thank you to Sergic. I'll give him a moment to pull up the CIO report. Uh, and uh, while that's being pulled up, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying I feel like this is the, uh, the junior varsity speaking uh, after uh, Mr. Dudley's comments, because uh, it's a, uh, he's far uh, more insightful, greater knowledge. So everything here will be lesser than what we just, you know, uh, discussed in the uh, credit uh, and risk mitigation committee, but I thought that those comments were uh, and discussion was excellent. So Sergic, if we could turn to slide four, please. Thank you. And uh, maybe I'll start on this slide with an oh my, uh, in that this is the results of the, the marks of the global financial markets as of April 30th, the end of April. Um, uh, it's very different than the discussions we were having over the last several years, consistent with uh, what Mr. Dudley was discussing. Uh, calendar year to date, as represented in the uh, chart in the upper left, the broad equity markets represented by the ACWI uh, index uh, is down 13%. Uh, through yesterday, it was down 17%. Uh, so these are, uh, challenging, trying times. Uh, maybe the bigger story, once again, this was discussed in the Credit and Risk, Risk Mitigation Committee that the bigger story or the cause may be the core bond market, which is in the bottom right, uh, which is down 9.5% uh, year to date. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend 
the intelligent investor column that talked about this is the worst bond market since 1842. Um, I don't remember that bond market, um, but uh, that's a, a long time ago. Uh, this slide is different than what we'll discuss in several slides as it relates to our performance for the period ending in March, the end of the, our third fiscal quarter, the first calendar quarter. Um, several other observations from the slide uh, that we are clearly in volatile market times, uh, that uh, we discussed high inflation, uh, that there is a polar change in monetary policy. We're moving from an environment of you know, Fed tightening versus Fed easing, not just in the US, but th these are uh, global conditions. Uh, these actions depress financial assets as opposed to inflating them. Most of us have had investment careers with a tailwind. Now we have a headwind and uh, this is very different. Um, we've had 40 years where we've witnessed declining rates that's incented investors to uh, invest in equity, in more complicated uh, structures beyond just public equities and embrace risk. In some sense, now we are in a vehicle that we have to make a U-turn in. However, we've never realized that there was a steering wheel in that vehicle. So I, I think that we really need to, um, uh, to recognize the, the difference in uh, the environment. Uh, slide seven, please. Continuing with kind of my positive theme uh, is this slide, you know, discusses war, disease, and challenging economic conditions. Uh, uh, you know, many economists, you know, are predicting recession maybe next year. Uh, this is a tough slide to look at, uh, not a happy slide to look at. And often our industry congratulates itself on bull markets and kind of you know, ignores the down ones. Um, however, this is the environment for us, Lucera, and, and maybe this is where I'll morph from, from doom and gloom and, and negativity to positivity, where we, Lucera, redouble our efforts for our members, that we continuously reimagine our processes, we challenge our conventions. Uh, and I'll give a couple of examples. We've embraced new strategies. Uh, we've invested over the last couple of years in energy transition and agriculture. Uh, we have new implementation models that we're considering, uh, for example, real estate. We've focused a lot on fees and in down markets, fees matter more. Um, we've done tremendous work in credit and hedge funds uh, with dedicated managed accounts and hard fee hurdles. I still think that there's work to do in private equity. Uh, that's an industry-wide issue, uh, but fees matter and we're focused on them. Uh, we have new models that we've embraced. We have private equity co-investment, real asset secondaries. Um, we've also increased the breadth of our diligence. You know, we focus more than ever on environmental social governance concerns, a DEI, and we do more operational due diligence than ever. So I think that this is consistent with the board approved strategic initiatives of allocator to best in class investor. So, so maybe the, the, the negative themes inspire us to, to be better. Uh, slide nine, please. Thank you, Sergic. Uh, this shows our March performance. Uh, March was a very positive month. The fund was up 2.1% net. The market value was back above 75 billion. Uh, the asset allocation uh, is on the right side of this chart and our actual is very close to our targets. And on the bottom, it shows that we had $953 million uh, of cash at the end of the quarter. Uh, and that cash certainly in volatile markets provides comfort. Next slide, please. So the quarter, I'll talk a bit about the quarter and fiscal year to date. Uh, and this shows it for the pension fund and the OPEB trust. Uh, for the quarter, uh, Lacera, we printed a negative quarter down 20 basis points net. Uh, uh, don't like down quarters. Uh, maybe the relative performance is positive. I, I read in the Wall Street Journal this morning that in the Wilshire Tux index, the, the median pension plan was down, I believe the article said 4%. Uh, and this type of 
outperformance in down markets uh, is meaningful. Lucera were a mature pension plan, we're cash flow negative, and consistent with our investment beliefs, sequence of returns matter because sequence of returns and the timing of, of negative prints impact or may impact our funded status. Uh, once again, this is an investment belief. Uh, we have several actuarial sessions over the balance of the year. I believe that we have one scheduled for next month. And uh, I, I know that there'll be a good discussion as it relates to our actuarial experience and position. Fiscal year to date, uh, the fund is above our benchmark. Uh, through the end of March, we're above our actuarial target. Uh, that is likely reversed since the quarter end. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm ever more mindful of, you know, as we get close to the end of our fiscal year, uh, of implications of when we do a, a hard close of our books for both uh, financial accounting and actuarial purposes. Uh, fiscal year to date, real assets is helping the plan. Uh, it's our best performing asset category. And I know that this is something that the chair mentioned at the beginning at the top, that, you know, Lacera, the fund is more diversified than ever. Uh, these market conditions, you know, the actual timing of them is a surprise, but not the existence of challenging uh, market conditions. You know, I, I look back on our actual asset allocation five years ago, five years ago at the end of March, global equities, public equities was about 50% of our assets. At the end of March of 2022, uh, that number's about 33%. So we've reduced our public equity exposure by a third. The Lacera plan is less of a single note and more diversified than ever. And that is why we can have positive rel relative ex uh, experience vis-a-vis uh, -vis our peers and why we can weather changing market conditions, much like what Mr. Dudley was speaking. OPEB, uh, AUM, as of the end of the quarter was $2.6 billion. Uh, the March return was up 1.6%. The quarter down 3.4%, and that's just because of the different asset allocation and different implementation uh, to be expected. OPEB did better in uh, market conditions where public equities were resuming. Uh, we do have an RFP in process for uh, alternative assets uh, and a provider to help us with that. Um, and, and that once again is in process. And the last slide I'll discuss uh, is slide 17, please. So on the bottom left, uh, last, month I, last month I discussed our cash overlay. I'll, I'll discuss it again. Uh, the cash overlay is working as designed uh, in several dimensions. First, it's a risk management tool. It helps us every day rebalance towards our strategic asset allocation targets. It's also a, a liquidity management tool, which allows us to hold more cash and avoid having to sell or rebalance uh, in down markets. Uh, year to date, as uh, it's not, here shows inception to date gain and loss and shows the March uh, gain and loss. Uh, it is quite cash generative. In the month of March, our cash by reducing our active risk and rebalancing towards target uh, generated $68 million. Um, year to date through, I, I looked at the flash report this morning, that's up, it's up $160 million. And when I think about, I know there's a budget hearing next week, um, that's more than the Lacera operating budget. So if we can be smarter about cash, we can use it as a rebalancing tool. It can help us for business continuity purposes and liquidity management, and also be cash generative. You know, that, that's pretty attractive from my perspective. Um, and maybe it's an example of, of what was discussed in that slide where I started with the negatives and, and tried to, to spin it, um, that this is an example of how we're reimagining our processes, that we're working harder, we're working smarter, and, and we're doing it for the right reason. We're doing it for our members. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to pause for questions. Great, thank you. If we can't uh, take down the uh, presentation, because otherwise I won't be able to see 
if anybody's request. Okay, thank you. Uh, two comments, I don't see any requests to uh, speak, but uh, two comments, uh, Mr. Grable, uh, with regards to the, the, the portfolio diversification. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that under your leadership, the Board of Investments um, adopted uh, the asset allocation that is, is, playing, is paying dividends in my view uh, today. And, and that's what you can always emphasize that uh, asset allocation, we gotta look for those periods uh, like now uh, and how well we perform in is, is, is evident. The other comment I have also is with regards to the liquidity. I mean, that's, that's very important. Uh, we, we learned, I learned uh, from 2008, 2009, that uh, having uh, sufficient liquidity for us to continue to um, issue capital calls uh, or fulfill capital calls and continue our investment uh, process, as well as being able to uh, comfortably uh, pay uh, the benefits. So uh, again, thank you for all that work and I'm gonna give you credit for all that. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none, we're moving forward. So I'm moving to consent items, uh, item seven. Uh, now, my understanding, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you saw my, my hand up. I, I don't oh, know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just, just a quick question for Jonathan and the investment, investment team. Um, Given that you what you said before that a number perhaps a number of your partners um, across our ecosystem have not managed in this type of environment before right so the easy money the easy tailwinds have turned is there a different um, lens from a partner management team that you are uh, applying now or leaning into now in terms of of maybe trying to um, determine which ones have the capacity to make the adjustments and the type of decisioning in the new environment versus those who were kind of riding the wave. Just curious, just in terms of, does this provide an opportunity to kind of separate the pretenders from the contenders a little bit from uh, an investment management partner perspective? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Jones. I'll answer the following way. One is, may sound somewhat tongue in cheek, but is quite serious. I think that every private equity hedge fund, real estate alternatives manager should give over the last decade a portion of their carried interest to the Federal Reserve. You know, it's just that that this tailwind, uh, this subsidy. Uh, may have been underappreciated. And, and everything obviously is obvious in hindsight. To directly answer the question is, it's a part of our diligence is that our diligence needs to always be better. We need to have more modules in our diligence. Uh, operational due diligence is more critical than ever. Looking at the backgrounds of the team and making sure that there's a variety of experiences uh, that not everyone, you know, came from the same exact firm, went to the same exact school. I think that those different perspectives um, help our partners and help us have more fulsome discussions about what potential challenges are. So it's something that we do discuss. I think our process internally has gotten better. You know, I think that that more voices speak in our internal discussions. Um, but it absolutely needs to be part of our evaluations. Uh, and it's something that we do discuss in terms of, is, has this firm just been financial engineering? And, or as this firm, do they have something that's sustainable uh, uh, in a variety of different economic uh, scenarios? Thanks, John. Great, thank you for that, uh, Mrs. Jones. Good morning. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment that um, uh, I second what you were saying about looking at your other counterparts for retirement plans. Um, I do think Lacera's diversification is really um, holding strong during this period um, because I do know that there are other plans that are struggling and the fiscal year to date return is, is excellent. I just have a quick question, um, just if you could just share 
um, we're approaching year end. Um, we do see where the markets are today. We're not sure, um, you know, in the next month what things are going to look like. Um, but I just wanted you to just kind of share your thoughts about, um, you know, last year and the returns you received last year and how that can help out this year if we don't come in at, at the discount rate or if we're short of the discount rate this year. Um, but just giving your thoughts about um, where we stand at the end of this fiscal year and how possibly last year can benefit us. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll start with a quick answer in that there will be a series of actuarial discussions over the next series of months, including starting next month. Actuarial discussions are a long game, a very long game. Uh, we tend to focus on short-term market moves uh, when we think about investment portfolios. Uh, and as it relates to 7%, that 7% is on average over the long term, recognizing that there are periods that may be over and there may be periods that are under, as it relates to last year, if we recognize our gains over you know, five years, that means that you know, four-fifths of 25% have yet to be uh, incorporated into the funded status of the, the Lacerra Fund. There are other actual actuarial experiences that may be less positive, and all these positive and negative variances compared to assumptions are all amortized over time. And that is what the actuaries present in an experience study to the Board of Investments for the Board of Investments to make, to continue to make prudent decisions about all our actuarial assumptions. So I think that that last year did provide a, a, a subsidy, so to speak. Uh, it pulled forward some returns, but I think that we need to be mindful um, where we're going and I know this is a long answer, but I think that one of the things that we did at the end of a very positive year was uh, broaden the diversification of the fund. So we captured some of those gains and then we, we you know, built in some defensive portfolio mechanisms thereafter. So I, I think that none of us know what's gonna happen, but I think that, um, that we're all acting as prudent fiduciaries in the best interest of our members. Thank you. And I, and I agree. Uh, I, I think that the diversification is very impressive and the returns are doing well. And um, I look forward to how we maneuver through the next, uh, as we heard from the gentleman from the feds, um, how we navigate in this next year or so. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Uh, moving uh, forward, uh, item seven, consent items. Now, my understanding is uh, subsection A that's being pulled by Mr. Kelly. Um, so I will entertain a motion to uh, approve B, C, D, and E. Now, with regards to uh, item C, um, I don't, um, hold on, let me find my way here. Um, the, okay, I don't see, uh, it's important that uh, we recognize that the motion should include the changes that were made at the border retirement, which is included in the uh, package um, as a supplemental, uh, as a supplemental memo. So anyway, with that, unless there's any questions, I will entertain a motion to approve B, C, D, and E. I'll move. It's been moved. This is David. I'll second it. It's been moved and second. Any discussions on those items? Seeing none. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Knox. Aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Kehoe. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mrs. Jones? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. And Chair, uh, I don't see Ms. Sanchez back in the room. Uh, Chair Santos? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. 
Okay, so now we'll go back to subsection A, uh, Mr. Keller. Uh, I just asked that that be pulled because I, I'm going to abstain on that one. So I wanted it separated out, but we can we can go forward with the motion. Okay, got it. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly, for that. Um, all right, I will entertain the motion to approve uh, subsection A. So moved. Second. It's been moved on second. Any discussions? Seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Knox? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mrs. Jones? Aye. Mr. Kelly? I'm staying. Thank you. And Chair Santos? Yes. Okay, the motion passes with one abstention. Great, thank you for that. So that concludes the consent items. Going into uh, reports, uh, section A, subsection uh, alpha, uh, Mr. Craig. Yes, uh, Chair Santos, um, at the last meeting, uh, uh, Trustee Kelly requested that um, we place an item on the agenda for uh, discussion about um, the return of the trustees to the boardroom uh, to hold the public hearings or the, their public meetings. And so we provided a, a, a report that outlined or mentioned that staff had uh, returned to the office last week um, and so uh, we did place the, the item on the agenda and um, be more than happy to, uh, to stand for questions or um, if Mr. Trustee Kelly has a, um, a comment um, about this, that would be great. Thank you for that, Mr. Kreiman. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Yes, thank you, I do have, um, I, thank you, I do have some comments if I can find my comments. Um, thank you, Santos, for um, putting this report together. I had asked for the update because I'm increasingly uncomfortable with the recommendation that the governor's COVID-19 state of emergency and physical distancing requirements from public health limit our ability to meet in person. And in today's vote, I abstained. I've looked through the um, governor's website for the state of emergency orders, and he's issued 561 since the pandemic began. He began lifting many orders last summer. Um, he issued more orders in the winter in response to the Omicron surge. And as of February 2022, just several months ago, uh, only 30 or 5% of the total orders were still on the books. The great majority of those are set to expire June 30th, and the remaining orders will be related to hospital and healthcare worker capacity building. As well, related to um, the physical distancing um, requirements of the past, it really is now just a best practice measure. Um, it's increasingly challenging to find the term physical distancing in a public health office's order as a requirement because it's been replaced with the requirements to vaccinate fully and to wear a mask, a mask that, focus, that focuses on fit and filtering. Um, but my more material concern with the recommendation is that it conflicts with the return to work requirement in place for Lacera staff. Adoption of the recommendation, I think, institutionalizes a two-tier classification of persons based on hierarchy. I believe that if we think it's not safe for us to meet in person, then it shouldn't be safe for anyone to meet in person. Um, and as we've learned from uh, uh, our CEO, Lacera Stafford, have begun to return to work uh, last week. I think throughout this pandemic, all of us have been very impressed with the ways in which our board, our staff, our consultants and other parties navigated the challenges that the pandemic presented, always focusing on our members. We saw that office protocols and return to work plans evolved as the virus and, re and related regulations required. And it is really in that spirit that I would respectfully ask our chair and vice chair to reevaluate with their peers on the Board of Retirement a continued delay in this body returning to the boardroom for the reasons I've noted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I don't see any requests to speak. I mean, this is, colleagues, this is the opportunity uh, to have any discussions. Certainly, um, it will uh, help me as the chair and, and to in my discussions with uh, the CEO and the CIO in terms of the return back to for the board members to return back to uh, meeting in person. Any comments, any um, guidance? Oh, uh, Mr. Knox. Sure, I'll dive in as somebody that is just getting over COVID right now. 
Um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, I think the emergency orders at this point, in my opinion, are essentially to um, keep in place this option for us to meet virtually as well, which I think is a very good thing. Um, I, I, I do think at some point soon we should transition to a hybrid model where people have the option to either be virtual or in person. Um, I, I think there's great value to being in person and, and being able to network and being able to, you know, pick someone's brain on a, on a particular topic um, that can be very useful. And, and especially as we incorporate new trustees like Ms. Jones, um, you know, I met uh, Liz Greenwood, I think once, you know, two and a half years ago and, and really haven't had a chance to connect, never met Mr. Jones in person. So, so I, I think there's value that I think hanging our hat just on that governor's declaration. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem to, to, to fit the bill in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nax, uh, Mrs. Jones. I just wanted to clarify. So we did vote on item A, which was to extend the virtual meetings for another 30 days, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, so I won't contradict that because we voted for that. Um, I will say uh, when we are ready to go back to in-person meetings, um, I do agree. Um, we should look at some form of a hybrid model um, we have extended that here at the city where I work, and it has proven to be beneficial. Um, I don't know if the accommodations as far as IT and the requirements are to facilitate that, um, but I do think that, that there is definitely value for that. Um, it one gives the, the attendees the ability to, you know, log in and participate if they had public comment um, in, in a virtual capacity. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm for exploring and discussing it, but I do still, you know, believe that um, this is still an issue that people are looking at um, and are very sensitive to, and I understand that. Thank you for that, Mrs. Jones. Anybody else? Uh, Herman, I'll, uh, I'll just comment. Uh, that uh, we, we did have a hybrid model uh, in place at one point, and uh, that appeared to be pretty successful where people that wanted to uh, attend could uh, could attend uh, in person, but I think there wasn't a ton of interest in that. I think everybody remained in a virtual uh, manner. Uh, that being said, I definitely don't think uh, bringing back the full boardroom and going in that direction is the route to, to take at this point. I do think the possibility of a hybrid um, is something that we could definitely look at, and I'd be in the I'd be in support of. But uh, you know, cases are continuing to be on the rise. We don't know what that's going to have in the future. So I'd hate to to bring everybody back and then be in a situation where we got to reverse that. So I think hybrid is a good first step um, until the governor order is changed. And then I also like to highlight that. We, uh, uh, Lucera just uh, uh, supported a bill that allowed for essentially a hybrid option to be in place moving forward uh, indefinitely. So we're looking at uh, uh, the, I know that uh, the legislature is looking at allowing that type of an opportunity. So I do think that we need to keep that, um, uh, you know, as, as we move forward. I think the reality is, is in years from now, we're still going to be in a situation where we have hybrid uh, opportunities. So I think focusing on that is the way to go. Great. Thank you for that, Mr. Kiko. Um, I don't see any other. Uh... Chairman uh, Santos, just real uh, quick. Yes, yeah, Mr. Jones. Yeah, having come on board, uh, you know, during the virtual and not actually having seen the room or the public space, uh, that that we hold our meetings in is it um, does the, does the spatial nature of the room allow for some you know some distancing or is it one of those ones that inherently we're kind of on top of each other you know kind of snug in with the public I'm just not aware um, and I'm sure that plays some calculus a little bit in in the consideration that we have because you know like uh, 
like Keith, and I'm um, sorry to hear about yours too, but I went to the global conference and I was about as you know, anti-social as I could be in, amongst the group of 3,500 and attended only sessions that were mostly outside and all of that and still, you know, came home with, uh, with, an, with a positive test um, there from that standpoint. Um, and that was a crowd that I, for all intents and purposes, was already vaccinated themselves uh, in order to be admitted. So just question a little bit from a prudent standpoint, does the room even really allow for you know, ventilation or otherwise for, you know, um, congregation at, at this stage. Thank you for that. Uh, before I, I call on, on Mr. Kreiman, uh, let me let me uh, make a couple of comments. Um, I, I, I think uh, I have the same concerns that Mr. Jones has in terms of um, all being in the same room, the, you know, the uh, tightness of it. So, I do welcome uh, directing the staff based on the comments that we have heard uh, to uh, come back next month with a proposal or, or some guidance that we can look and evaluate. Um, that will include the hybrid model that was suggested, uh, whether or not we able to, the hybrid model, whether we able to implement, you know, a red team versus blue team or whatever you, you guys call in those teams or whatever you want to call us. Um, and also the the uh, uh, rapid test requirement uh, for the day before. I think that will definitely give me some comfort as we heard both from Mr. Knox and Mr. Jones and, and we all experienced my own dilemma when I uh, was positive uh, that even though I'm fully vaccinated, uh, and I'm assuming all my other colleagues are, as well who got sick, that being vaccinated, uh, you're still going to get it, and you're still going to transmit it. So that's a concern uh, for me. Uh, so in terms of coming back next month uh, with ideas so we can evaluate, uh, we need to think about that, and that will be my request. I think that the goal, and I want to uh, kind of check with Mr. Kehoe, uh, the goal will be uh, in terms of direction to the staff to uh, have whatever um, plan we can all feel comfortable with, or at least the clear majority, uh, to look into come back sometime perhaps in, in August. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that, Mr. Kehoe? Uh, I, I think the best bet is to uh have the uh, chair and vice chair meet with uh, staff to discuss it probably with both boards and and come up with um, a suggestion and then bring it back to the board um, to, to discuss and then uh, that way we'd have a clear direction on that um, and if August is the date of a, of a hybrid implementation then then and that's possible then I'd be in support of that but I think uh, I, I think the uh, chairs and vice chairs of both boards get together discuss with staff and then bring it back um, obviously each board can have their own um, uh, rules but uh, at the end of the day we should probably do this as a coordinated effort great suggestion Mr. Kehoe and so in terms of direction to the staff Mr. Kreiman uh, you heard Mr. Kehoe is pretty much in line with what I was saying is, and I like the idea of August, I'm not available for the rest of the month to meet. Uh, so we'll have to, any meeting uh, with myself and the chair of the Board of Retirement. And I think we, we should also include the vice chairs as well uh, to see if we can have it uh, sometime in, in June. Uh, again, to have whatever proposal be brought back to both boards in July with the goal of perhaps implementation in August. Is, is that clear to you, Mr. Kreiman? Yes, per, very clear. We'll uh, schedule the meeting for June and then we'll prepare the report uh, for consideration, both boards consideration in uh, July. Okay, great. For, okay. for an August hybrid. Yes, thank you for that. Now, you, I know you had your hand up, uh, so this is your- No, no, My, no this, this is fine, clear direction. I just wanted to make the comment that we have made um, the upgrades to the uh, to the hearing room. It is quite small, uh, Mr. Jones. Um, we've had 
made arrangements in terms of how we're going to deal with uh, the public coming into the uh, into the hearing room to make uh, their public comments in person. Uh, so we do have some protocols that we've lined out. Um, we'll have to talk with the uh, the board chairs about the testing protocols. Um, that was not included in the plans that we had moving forward. And so uh, look forward to the discussion. Um, we have, uh, Mr. Jones, um, we can accommodate a hybrid work model because we have had mock uh, uh, board hearings as part of our upgrades to the board. So um, we're, we're fully prepared to, uh, to host a hybrid work model. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any uh, other comments? All right, we're moving forward. Okay, so the balance of the reports B, C, D, E, and F, they're for information only. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions, comments regarding any of those reports? I see none. So we're moving forward now to uh, items for staff review. I don't believe we have any except uh, what we just discussed, Mr. Grant. Yes, yes that's, the, uh, that's the only item, uh, Mr. Santos, for staff to have a further discussion with the Board of Retirement and Board of Investment Chairs and Vice Chairs regarding the return to the boardroom plan. Okay, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, go to the order. Um, Linda, would you do recall? Yes, uh, Mr. Knox? Good morning, nothing from me. Thank you, Mr. Green? I don't have anything, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. No, it's not on my end. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, nothing on my end. Mrs. Jones. Nothing on my end. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I wanted to welcome staff back. Um, it was nice to see the videos of our executive team uh, and welcoming them back. And also just to give a head, uh, shout out to our systems group, which um, did a really tremendous job since uh, since we first faced the pandemic from a whole bunch of different perspectives. So welcome back everyone and thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grable. Uh, nothing to add, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rice. Um, yes, good morning. I wanted to introduce to the Board of Investments, Jessica Rivas, who is a new staff counsel in the legal office who joined on uh, May 2nd, so she's, she's in her, her second week. Uh, Jessica comes to us uh, after eight years in county council, uh, a year or so at the California Attorney General's office and some time also in the district attorney's office. Uh, she is a graduate of NYU Law School, a uh, very well credentialed individual. We're glad to have her with us. Among her, her the other attributes that she, she brings to uh, Tula Sarah is, is a strong commitment to public service, not in terms of just her employment, but also in her work outside um, the, the, the nine to five um, schedule. She was a uh, major judge advocate in the U.S. Army Reserve for, for nine years. She's been very active uh, in her community here in Pasadena, and she actually currently serves as a city council member on the Pasadena City Council. Uh, so we're delighted to have Jessica join us. And I wanted to introduce her to you. You can see she's on camera now. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with everyone. Welcome, Ms. Rivas. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kreiman. Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, and Chair Santos. Thank you. I wanted I wanted to repeat what I said earlier um, uh, with regards to where we are at in terms of the asset allocation and the liquidity side, uh, it, it's really important. Again, to thank your colleagues, because I know uh, uh, Mr. Grable has the great suggestions, but it's up to us to adopt it. So we uh, uh, have done a tremendous job. I think this is an opportunity to pat ourselves on the back and uh, work well done. So again, thank you for your leadership, Mr. Grable. Thank you. Uh, everyone else. So this concludes the go to the order? Yes. The, yes. Okay, so at this point, we're going to executive session. Let's take it uh, a couple minutes to clear the room. Yes, just us, five minutes. So we'll be back at 9.44. Okay, five minutes, 9.44. 44.